It's been said that Noam Chomsky is one of the most cited authors in history, up there with Shakespeare and the Bible even, and his work covers a huge range. Take his latest book, it's called Illegitimate Authority, a collection of interviews on subjects as varied as Joe Biden, climate change, abortion rights in the United States, the economic fallout from COVID-19, the war in Ukraine, Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, and much more besides. No, welcome to Times Radio. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, and don't take too seriously the output of PR. We're going to... <laughs> <laughs> now, listen, I want to talk to you, first of all, about um, how you are described. If you're filling in a form... What's your occupation? Do you write down public intellectual, as other people might expect? What's your What's your job? I teach. Uh, I'm a university professor. I right? teach courses on linguistics, cognitive science, philosophy, uh, social and political issues, and like any other academic. Do you like being thought of a public intellectual or is is the idea of a public intellectual a sort of old-fashioned thing in a world where everyone can pump out their opinions in public all the time? Well, I never took the concept public intellectual very seriously and I don't take it very seriously now. <laughs> People like me who and you who have a relative amount of privilege or able to uh, enter the public domain with uh, our thoughts and opinions. They may be of some value, maybe not. Maybe the guy who's cleaning the street outside has better opinions, but not the privilege. Um, the, the start of the book, the preface of your book, says, we live in dangerous and disconcerting times. I wonder whether you think now is a more dangerous and disconcerting time than when you, you first came to prominence back in the 60s with the Vietnam War, the Cold War. How does the times we live in today compare to the other times that you've lived through and written about? Far more dangerous. There's actually a pretty simple, straightforward measure of the danger. Not perfect, but as good a simple measure as we have. That's the doomsday clock. Uh, the analysts gave up minutes during the Trump years, moved to seconds to midnight, midnight's termination. Now moved it to 90 seconds to midnight. It's never been anywhere near that. And there are good reasons for it. We're, first of all, the danger of nuclear war is increasing. No question about that. But we're racing towards a precipice of environmental destruction of a couple of decades in which we could mitigate or control it, but we're racing in the opposite direction. Nothing could be more dangerous than that. That means reaching irreversible tipping points at which stage uh, just steady decline to the destruction of human life on Earth. We've never faced that before. Actually, we've been facing it in a way since August 6, 1945, but never at this level of danger. It's interesting that I was going to ask you, the, if, you if we are on that path, I suppose some people would say we've been on that path for a long time, and even the warning of getting closer to that point doesn't seem to make politicians, leaders of any country, of any political persuasion seem to be grasped by the moment. Do you, do, do you, you know, when you, when you talk there, it sounds apocalyptic, and yet, you know, we spend our time talking about trivial things. Well, the things, things like the Ukraine war, the Yemen war, the total destruction of Iraq going on still, these are all very serious things, many more. Mm. But it's true that there's a, background issues creeping up on us and very little is being done about it. Uh, the, maybe something is Goldman Sachs just had a study of uh, China. They claim that China is going to 
Looks as if it's going to reach its uh, goals of deco of uh, net zero uh, fossil fuels much earlier than was expected. So maybe that's a good sign. <laughs> but uh, most of us are going completely in the wrong direction. Last year, fossil fuel production increased. Uh, the United States, is, which is right now the leading fossil fuel producer, expanding with new fields, uh, opening up federal lands for exploration for decades ahead. The fossil fuel companies are euphoric with the prospects for increased public support for their uh, enterprise of destroying life on Earth. So it doesn't look good. You mentioned the uh, the war in Ukraine. Let, let's turn our attention to that. Um, certainly in in the UK, the left, uh, actually under people like Jeremy Corbyn, had argued that it wasn't Russia that was the enemy, it was the US that was destabilising the world. And then Russia invades a sovereign democratic country right on its on its border, starting a con conflict which has claimed tens of thousands of, of innocent lives. Does that not make clear that who the real threat to the world is. It's not the US, as the left is, has argued for a long time. It's, it's Vladimir Putin's Russia. Well, the invasion of Ukraine is plainly a war crime. Can put it in, can't put it in the same category as greater war crimes, but it's a major one, uh, according to the uh, official, uh, the only evidence that we have, solid evidence is, United Nations estimates, uh, Pentagon estimates, and so on. They estimate about 8,000 civilians killed. That's a lot of people. What the United States and Britain do overnight, it's uh, presumably it's an underestimate. So let's say it's twice that much. That would put it at the level of the U.S.-backed invasion, Israeli invasion of Lebanon, which killed about maybe 20,000 people. Suppose it's off by a factor of 10. That is, the casualty rate is really 10 times as high as is claimed. Well, that would put it in the category of Ronald Reagan's terrorist atrocities in El Salvador, roughly on the order of 80,000. So it's here. Of course, Iraq is just another dimension. So it's serious. It's a terrible crime. Uh, you can understand why the global south does not take very seriously the uh, eloquent uh, uh, protestations of Western countries about this unique episode in history. Uh, they've been victims of far more. Maybe the Russians will go on to our level. Maybe, maybe they'll go on to, uh, you may recall how many people visited Baghdad while the United States and Britain were pulverizing it. Nobody visited Baghdad. In fact, anyone there, UN inspectors, uh, peace activists were taken out of the country because it was too dangerous when the U.S. and Britain go to war. No foreign leaders feeling, visiting it like, I presume, Russia could up the ante and move on to the U.S.-British style war. Maybe they could even go to the point of commemorating atrocities like Mariupol uh, with uh, uh, the way the United States is now commemorating its uh, some of its worst atrocities in Iraq. Like uh, one of the worst atrocities was the marine assault on Fallujah. Beautiful city, one of the most beautiful in Iraq, destroyed. Unknown numbers of people killed, uh, but the uh, the people still dying from the weapons that were used. Uh, the United States Navy just com just commissioned its latest warship, the USS Fallujah, in honor of the Marine assault, which carried out one of the worst atrocities in Iraq. Well, maybe the Russians will get to that point too someday. It's interesting, though, Noam Chomsky, and we hear the same thing from, from the left here in the UK. It sounds... It something to do with the left. These are just... What it is, but certainly from, from left-wing politics in the UK, this, 
this trying to create equivalence, the, an anti-West position, um, become well, you are you're drawing equivalence. You are drawing equivalence. You're saying that you've just you've literally just drawn equivalence with with the number of deaths in various places. I've, explain to people listening to this why what you're not saying is because Ronald Reagan did this or George Bush did that. That doesn't make what Vladimir Putin's done all right, does it? Of course not. I said it's a major crime, but there's no equivalence that following the party line. I gave figures, no equivalence. Maybe the casualty toll is 10 times as high as is estimated. Well, that would make it like Reagan's crimes in El Salvador. It's not equivalent. But I suppose some people listening to this will think you're seeking to excuse what no, that's, has done. that is a fabrication of the right wing. I am not seeking to excuse anything. I said it's a terrible war crime. That's not excusing anything. I'm talking about the extreme hypocrisy of claims about how this is the worst thing that ever happened when it's a fraction of what we do all the time. That's why the global south is watching with ridicule as a pompous uh, Western commentators try to lecture them on why don't you join us in opposing this terrible crime. So a leader gets up and says, how can you not join us when a country is attacking another country? Uh, they laugh and ridicule. That's what you've been doing to us forever. Do you think Britain's complicit in that in the same way, or is it specifically an American problem? One is. Do you think that Britain is complicit in the same way, or is it specifically an America problem? Did Britain take part in the invasion of Iraq? Did Britain take part, in fact, a leading role in the destruction of Libya? Yes, Britain is more than complicit. Is Britain sending arms to Saudi Arabia to implement the worst humanitarian crisis in the world in Yemen? Of course. Couldn't go on easily. That's now, not in the past. I want to take you back to something you said in August 2020. You said that uh, there was a Russian red line for 30 years. We'll tolerate your violation of faith. Firm pledge not to move NATO to our borders. Uh, when it comes to, uh, you were talking about the, the idea of Ukraine going into NATO would be a red line. Actually, what we've seen as a result of Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Is, is Ukraine becoming much closer to the West? Finland and Sweden, Sweden, Finland and Sweden are now joining NATO as a result of what Vladimir Putin has been doing. Do you think Vladimir Putin miscalculated that he drew red lines thinking that they would never be crossed? Well, first of all, the talk about a red line, you misattributed. It's not me. It's virtually the entire U.S. diplomatic corps current head of the CIA, past heads, uh, the defense secretary, Halkish defense secretary of uh, Bush, uh, William Perry, defense secretary of Clinton. They're the ones who have been saying mm. that this is a red line. Don't attribute it to me. I'm just okay. quoting them. Yep. Okay. So it's almost the entire top of the political policy class and diplomatic corps who know anything about Russia have been arguing for 30 years that it is reckless and dangerous to try to cross what is a red line for every Russian leader, Yeltsin, Gorbachev, everyone, enter, allowing Ukraine and Georgia to enter NATO. That's been clear for 30 years. Uh, so uh, did Putin make a mistake? Of course. Not only, not only was it a criminal act of aggression, but it was an act of criminal stupidity. Uh, he's driven Europe into Washington's control. It's a gift to the United States uh, on a silver platter. Uh, Finland and Sweden is a different issue. They have absolutely no reason to join NATO, and they know it perfectly well. 
The reason for joining NATO is they have advanced military systems. They've been pretty well integrated into NATO operations for many years. Joining NATO officially opens up new markets for their, in, for their military industry, a, a new potential for attaining advanced equipment and so on. There hasn't ever been, and they know it, the slightest threat to Sweden or Finland from Russia. Why, fact, well, we have, but what, but why not? When 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 you know we were told that we were told months before Russia invaded Ukraine, there was no prospect of them invading Ukraine. Repeatedly by Russia, 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 Russia said that they were not going to invade Ukraine, and then they did. Why? Yes, why wouldn't but, if you were, if you were Finland or Sweden? Why wouldn't you join NATO? For thirty years, not only Russia, every leader, but every top official in the United States with any interest in it, that NATO, that uh, that if Ukraine moves towards uh, entering NATO, it, uh, no Russian leader would ever accept it. Remember that Biden, take a look at what happened in 2021, 2022. We have a record. The Biden administration offered an enhanced program to Ukraine, enhanced program for NATO, uh, uh, for entering NATO. It uh, increased weapon supplies, interoperability of uh, weapons. Uh, the attacks in Donbass continued. Uh, this does not justify the invasion, but it's a background. Up until February 2022, Russia was still saying, why don't we try to, if you will consider our security concerns, we can have a, nego we can have a negotiated settlement. It was flatly rejected. It gets worse. Last March, there were negotiations between Ukraine and Russia under Turkish auspices. What did Britain do? Prime Minister Boris Johnson flew to Ukraine in far Kiev that Britain and the United States don't think this is a time for negotiations. He was followed by Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Defense for the uh, United States, who presumably gave his typical message, extremely clear, we have to continue the war to severely weaken Russia. Well, the negotiations collapsed. We don't know why Western media don't cover these things. Uh, we only know most, mainly from Ukrainian sources. For the Western media, like your journal, you don't cover peace and possibilities, you cover war. But th those are all the facts we know. Well, does that justify the criminal attack? No. Is it an act of criminal stupidity? Yes. And yet it does sound a bit like you are explaining it, because why can't Ukraine join NATO? They're an independent, sovereign country. Why can't they join NATO? What would happen if Mexico decided to join a Chinese-run international military alliance with uh, sending heavy weapons to Mexico aimed at the United States, uh, interoperability of Chinese and uh, Mexican uh, military systems? What would happen to Mexico? It'd be blown away. You know that. So you, but you're then drawing comparisons between NATO and China and Russia. That you, you, you see that an equivalence between... I don't. NATO is a much more aggressive alliance. NATO has invaded uh, Yugoslavia, invaded Libya, invaded Ukraine, backed up the invasion of Ukraine, backed up the invasion of Afghanistan. It's an aggressive military alliance. Everybody outside the West, in the West, we're not allowed to think it because we're deeply controlled by adherence to the party line. But everybody else can see this. So what do you think the purpose is then? You think that, that Ukraine, if NATO, if Ukraine were to join NATO, that this would form the basis of NATO invading Russia? Well, if uh, China put military bases in Mexico, it wouldn't be a sign for... China invading the United States, but the United States has been tolerated for 30 seconds. You know that very well.
But so it sounds to me like you are justifying the Russian invasion of Ukraine. You're saying the very act of the very act of wanting to enter NATO is grounds for Russia feeling sufficiently threatened to then invade Ukraine. The Western Party line, which Western intellectuals are instructed to adhere to uh, rigorously, says that if you tell the facts, that's justifying Russia. No, it's not justifying Russia. There's not even a hint of that, not even a remote hint. It's saying, here are the facts that we should face. That's the fact if you get out of the little Western propaganda bubble, move to the global south. Everybody says this. When the so United let, States... let, let, okay, let, let me put let me put something to you. Did the and we've seen it in certainly in British politics the an, the anti-West left, as I would describe them in the UK, where a position of being uh, anti-British imperialism, anti-American imperialism, be, being so anti-West essentially, led you to an alliance with Vladimir Putin. It was a new type of Russian leader. And it was all hunky dory up until the point he invades Ukraine, and now you're trying to you're essentially trying to justify it by the back door that he's 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 let you down, Vladimir Putin. Will you please stop reiterating the Western Party line and listen to what I'm saying? There's not a word of justification. There's no anti-West. I know, but you keep saying that, and then you keep making a justification. It was because of NATO, or it was because of Afghanistan, or it was because of uh, Libya. Oh, it's not a justification. Listen to the words, okay? There is nothing to justify the Russian invasion of Ukraine. There is nothing to justify the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Understand? Yep. But we can ask... Why is the global South collapsing in ridicule when it hears the kinds of things that you're talking about? Good reasons. And we should what do you be... mean When you say the global, you've used the phrase a couple of times, explain what you mean by the global South. India, Indonesia, South Africa, Brazil, uh, does Colombia, do you want me to list them? They're not lining up with Vladimir Putin though, are they? No, they're not lining up with Vladimir Putin. That's your reiteration of the Western Party line. They're taking a neutral position. What they're saying is this: they regard this as a proxy war between Russia and the United States over Ukrainian bodies. They're saying, we don't want to take part in it. That's not pro-Putin. That's the Western Party line. We should be able to escape the Western propaganda bubble and simply look at the facts. Let's zoom out a bit more then, just finding where we talk about politics. How do countries like Britain and America break away from the, as you put it, Western party line? Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, I think, just agreed with you on lots of things, actually, in, in politics. He, he went to the country twice and he lost twice. It turns out the country did not want Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister. Well, you know perfectly well that that's not what happened. Jeremy Corbyn won an enormous victory in 2017. No, he didn't. In, yes, the biggest victory that Labour had won in a generation. No, he wasn't. He lost. He didn't become Prime Minister. Then what happened is the British establishment, including your newspaper, came down on him with a ton of bricks with false, deceitful propaganda about uh, anti-Semitism, all exposed as lies. Totally. That's just not true. I'm afraid that's just not true. Labour MPs left the Labour Party because of anti-Semitism uh, when Jeremy Corbyn was leader. It was nothing to do with, with what I was doing. Labour MPs quit the party in protest yes. at Jeremy Corbyn's record. Absolutely. The parliamentary party, the Blairite parliamentary party, did not want to see. In fact, they said it. We have the documents in the labor files. Say we do not want to lose our party, the party that we own, to this effort to develop a popular-based party working for working people and the poor. 
We don't want to lose our party to that. No, that's not the, what they said. That's not what they said. They did not want Jeremy Corbyn. They said you could read it in the Labour they, files. They did not say they did not want a government that wanted to act for the poor. What they said was they did not I want someone. With a, yes, exactly. They didn't want to lose their party. I so had it. So a man on the track record of tolerating anti-Semitism in the Labour Party and uh, taking anti-West positions, including wanting to give Russia the benefit of the doubt over the Salisbury poisonings was one of the big things that they, they protested at. There's no, there's no anti-West position. For example, when Jeremy Corbyn uh, takes the position that we ought to try to move towards a negotiated settlement in Ukraine, that's not an anti-West position. Only the anti Ukraine position. The party line. Turns the party out. line. I don't have a party line. I'm just asking you a question about Jeremy Corbyn twice went up for election and twice he didn't become prime minister. That's two defeats. Jeremy, let's read let's go back to the facts. Twenty seventeen He lost Labor, He won the big He lost. He lost. Sorry, there was the biggest Labour election in history. Then came the It was no it wasn't. No, it wasn't. He lost. Then, that it was the biggest labor gain in history. Then on what ground? On what? No, it wasn't. On what basis was it? Then came the enormous establishment attack, across the board, right to left. It's what's called left guardian, with deceitful lies, all since exposed, about charges of anti-Semitism. No, that's Perhaps. not true. I'm sorry, the, the Equality and Human Rights Commission in the UK, the watchdog set up by the Labour Party, found the Labour Party guilty of not protecting Jews within the party. Less anti-Semitism in the Labour Party than among the Tories. This has all been exposed in detail by the Labour files. You can read it in Al Jazeera. The British press has chosen to mostly suppress it and marginalise it. But that's a problem for the British press. Corbyn has since been virtually kicked out of the Labour Party. His effort to try to develop a popular-based party, participatory party, that would serve the interests of working people and the poor was smashed by the British establishment to scandal. Okay? But it uh, has nothing to do with these other things that we're talking about. No, well, I suppose my, I suppose my, actually my original question was, how does politics change in the West then? America and Britain, is Keir Starmer the right person to try and recalibrate Britain's position in the world to not toe the line that you're, you're talking about? What do you think of Keir Starmer? How is it done? We know perfectly well. Take the New Deal in the 1930s, which I'm old enough to remember first. <laughs> the... Labor movement in the United States had been crushed almost totally by Woodrow Wilson's Red Scare. 1930s began to recoup, reorganize, uh, CIO organizing, militant actions, moderately sympathetic administration, introduced social democratic policies, which in fact were later picked up by Europe in the post-war period. That's the way politics changed. Something else has happened. Forty years ago, Reagan and Thatcher launched a major assault against the population. Class war, bitter class war. First act they undertook was to destroy the labor movement. Very sensible. It's the one defense against bitter class war. Then came... Uh, I can go through the details if you like, but if you want a number, <laughs> we have it from the Rand Corporation, respectable corporation. They estimate the transfer of wealth from the lower 90% of the population, working class and middle class, transfer of wealth to them to the top 1% during the Reagan years, Reagan, Clinton, the rest of them, at $50 trillion. That's impressive class war. Left the population uh, real wages for uh, non-supervisory workers are about what they were in 1979. Uh, uh, case after case, I can go through if you like. Similar things have happened elsewhere, Britain with the 
partial parity programs had written way back. Continent has held out somewhat. They still have um, residue of the social democratic policies. Uh, all of this has left uh, populations angry, resentful, uh, distrustful of institutions, quite rightly, easy prey to demagogues of the Trump, uh, Orban, Bolsonaro, or Farage variety. Okay, that's what's happened in the last 40 years. How do you change it? The way you changed it in the 1930s, by political action and organization, revitalization of the labor movement, and so on. Uh, it's not a secret. Has there been a British Prime Minister or American President that you liked in your lifetime? No. Not many. Roosevelt was a pretty decent president. Did some pretty rotten things, but he was a decent president. And do you feel like you're... I've talked, started off talking about you being a public intellectual. You've written so many. It must be millions of words, dozens of books, articles. Um, do you feel like you've you've failed in making the case, this case you've been making for such a long time, and it just hasn't at any point resonated on either side of the Atlantic? There are successes and failures. So one major success was after about 25 years of effort, uh, finally helping to organize enough popular opposition to the U.S.-British support for the worst, probably the worst act of genocide since the Second World War, namely the Indonesian invasion of East Timor, backed by the United States, by Britain, uh, killed maybe a third of the population well, didn't kill everybody, so there was a slight success. Uh, they still survive. There are other cases like that. During the 1980s, the, the um, anti-war moved to the 1970s, which 60s, mainly 1960s, are heavily involved in. We couldn't stop the U.S. massacres and destruction of all of Indochina but it didn't go to the terminal point. Something survived. So that's a partial success. 1980s, Reagan hoped to emulate early steps, tried to emulate what Kennedy had done in Indochina. There was so much public opposition, he had to back off. Had to resort to terror, massive terror. A couple hundred thousand people killed every kind of torture. You can imagine the country's wrecked, but it wasn't Vietnam. Okay, so there are partial successes. Do you ever think maybe I'm the one who's wrong? What? Do you ever think maybe I'm the one who's wrong? That you've, you've that you, that you might be wrong? Of course, all the time. <laughs> I was much too late in getting involved in the opposition to the Vietnam War, I began to get seriously involved when Kennedy radically escalated the war in the early 60s. Should have been involved 10 years earlier. There's many other things. <laughs> and finally then, um, let's round this off. Let's try and be a bit more optimistic. Do you think that we can turn these things around? You were talking about climate change before, global conflict. Will the next century be better than the last? There won't be organized human life a century from now unless we reverse the course that leadership is now taking uh, towards uh, racing over the precipice on climate destruction. You read the latest IPCC report, I'm sure. Okay, pretty accurate. Uh, IPCC are consensus reports, so they're by definition, conservative, lowest, uh, no, the lowest common con common denominator. Yeah, yeah. The current one, they took off the gloves. They are so desperate by now that they said, "We'll tell the truth." That's the truth. What are Western leaders doing? Mostly racing in the opposite direction.
Well, no, Tom's here. I was hoping it was going to end on a more upbeat note, but I fear that I fear that the the future might not be that upbeat. Noam Chomsky, thank you so much for joining us on Times Radio.